to them. So thank you for being here. Thank you for coming out on this Martin Luther King weekend. It's, uh, it's great to, to continue in the series we're, we're talking about. And I actually think Dr. King's life is, is, is an incredible opportunity for us to, to sort of be encouraged. Uh, I am I'm a great, well, everybody should be a great admirer because really his life was symbolic of what a difference one person can make. Seriously, it, 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 when you look at what he was able to accomplish, you have to just say, you know, if God can do that through him, God can do something significant through me as well. And so I, I want to encourage you to believe that the Lord can move through you to make a difference in your generation. And if you are ever in Memphis, Tennessee, I strongly encourage you to stop by the National Civil Rights Museum that is there. It is exceptional. I told somebody the other day, if you only have time to visit one thing in Memphis, skip the Pyramid and the Bass Pro Shop and go see see the Civil Rights Museum. And it's exceptionally well done. But we are in a series. And we, we kick this off on New Year, or I guess New Year's Eve. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know where God is going to take us individually and corporately. We're talking about foundations and framework and finish work, and, and we're looking you know to see how the Lord can prepare us. And if if you recall, we kicked off you know three weeks ago with with the New Year's Eve message where we talked about leave it behind. How are you doing at leaving stuff behind? This is, <laughs> I'm not overwhelmed, but don't worry about it. Everybody has this. Just because, you know, the best day to do something is what may have been a year ago, but today is a better day too. And so don't, don't kick yourself. Now, but then we went last week into the, we talked about grow, and we talked about, you know, just giving up stuff and walking away from things is really not what God has for us. He wants us to embrace things, right? And we talked about G-R-O-W. Remember the gross sermon from last week? So let's try this. How are you doing at embracing the things that God wants you to embrace? An equally enthusiastic response. I got to tell you, you know, here's, I'm going to make a deal with you. If I ask you a question, you are required to answer. You can say yes, no, or grunt loudly. Any of the three will be acceptable. So how are you doing at embracing the things you need to embrace this year? Okay, I heard, yeah, it's good, good, good. I like the grunts especially, that, that brings it. Well, those are the first two weeks, but or, is there a pirate in the crowd? All right, we've got, you know, we get into this. So now this is week, week, week three, and I, and I want to talk about uh, preparation. And because God, God wants you to be prepared. How many of you have ever heard of the, the six P's acronym? Anybody ever heard of that? Proper prior preparation or planning prevents poor performance. You guys ever heard? Yeah, I know. It's cheesy, but you'll never forget it. Trust me. Once you've heard it, it's ingrained in your mind. Proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. And God has an assignment for you. God has an assignment for me. God has an assignment for everybody in his kingdom. What God doesn't want to do is send you on your assignment unprepared. Uh, You know, seriously, unprepared people make their employers look bad. I mean, yeah, and if God is our employer, he doesn't want to look bad. So he wants you to be prepared. Let me, let me give you an example. Last weekend, our internet went out at the house. So I went over to Walmart, bought a router, trying to replace it, see if that would fix it. It didn't. We did get it back on. But, but we wanted to take it back. Well, David was off this week, so he volunteered, after I asked him, to, uh, to go take it back. So Dave takes it back to Walmart, and I, I get home from work, and I said, hey, were you able to return the router? He goes, no, and he hands it to me again. I go, what happened? He goes, I spent 30 minutes at customer service at Walmart trying to return this router. And, you know, she had to call people, and it wouldn't go through, and it was just a mess. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I appreciate you trying, though. And I'll take it back, you know, later. So an hour or so later, I got in my car, drove over, drove over to Walmart, walked up. There was no one in the customer service line. Literally walked up, laid the router with the, with the receipt taped to it on the counter. A lady came out, and I said, hi, you know, my son was over here earlier. He couldn't return this. You know, can you, can you fix it? And can you, what's the problem? And she said, I don't know. Let's see. So she takes out the magic wand, and she goes, click. And she goes, click. And she goes over the little thing. She goes, push push, push. She goes, done. Okay, serious? She goes, yeah, it's done. I don't know what his problem was. The problem was the first clerk was not prepared, and the second clerk was. 
So the question is, how does God want to prepare us to step, to step into the destiny that we have, to step into the assignment we have, to whatever it is we're called to do, how is he going to prepare us? And, and to, to, to ask that question, I want us to look at two passages of Scripture to two different congregations of early Christians. Now, the first is the church at Philippi. And we're going to be looking at Philippians 1, verses 3 through 11. So you can turn there with me or go there with me on your phones. But this is what it says. It's Paul writing, every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. It's a good thing to say. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. You got people you like praying for in your life? You got some people you really just enjoy praying for? That was what the Philippians were to Paul. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God. Wow, what a statement. Both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. What an incredible thing to say to a group of people. I mean, can you imagine how they felt when that letter arrived? Oh my gosh, Paul. That's what Paul said about us. I mean, that's that's a heck of an attaboy, right? I mean, and it's clear from Paul's writing that that these were all-star Christians. These were the honor roll students of, of, of Paul's ministry, the church at Philippi. They're doing great. Now, Now, I want you to contrast that with another passage of Scripture to a different congregation. And it's from the book of Hebrews. Now, they don't know which church actually received this letter, but they do know it was a Jewish congregation. All right. They also don't know who wrote it. Many people think Paul did, but that's debated. But irrespective, I want you to think about their reaction when they received this letter. And we'll be looking at verse uh, chapter 5, verse 11 is where we're starting. And so (laughs) it opens up. There is much more we would like to say about this, but it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. I just I hear I read that and I just go whoops. <laughs> no, it's I mean that's something to say to somebody who's a, you know hey I'd tell you this some more but really why bother you know because you're not you're not really connected and you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. It gets better and better, doesn't it? You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training, training, have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So let's stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let's go on instead and become more mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. Wow. What a difference. You know, if, if the first group in Philippi were honor roll students, it, it would not be wrong to describe this group of believers as kind of like the kid who comes home with a report card and the only A on the thing is the A in the word card. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, yeah, there's an A on my report card. It's right there. I mean, you know, it's, you know, Paul, it's, it's whoever wrote this is, is, is not being, 
Not being flattering, in fact, but, but he's, he's, he's really getting in their business. But he is not, he has not given up hope on them. As a matter of fact, they may be behind, but they can recover. Because you can go on to verse 9 of chapter 6, and, it's, and, and it says this. Dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we don't really believe it applies to you. Now, that, that, that's, that's a, he's extending a wand of hope, or a thing of hope, if you want to call it. We are confident that you are meant for better things. Look at your neighbor and say, you're meant for better things. You're meant for better things. Th- things that come with salvation. So there's stuff I get besides just eternal salvation. There's stuff that comes with my salvation. Yeah, and you're meant for those things. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. Our great desire is, for you, is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. That's what God wants for us, to inherit his promises, to to step into the life Christ died for us to have, to to take the, the, the promises of the Lord and not just go, oh, amen, but really just to own them, to, for them to manifest in our lives, for those things to become real, not just imaginations. But in order for that to happen, God has to prepare us, and we've got to go through the process. And so this morning, I just want us to, to, to really focus on that one expression. It says that we are confident that you are meant for better things, the things that will come, that come with salvation. And as we think about that, I want us to consider four things from these passages. What the, what the Hebrew Christians were doing right, because they didn't do everything wrong. What the Philippian Christians were doing right, how did they actually get Paul's accolades? I mean, you know, what was unique about them? What the Hebrew Christians were doing wrong. Why was the writer so upset with them? And how Paul told the Philippian Christians they could improve. They were doing great, but they they still had room to grow. And so in considering those, we go to the first one. What what were the the Hebraic Christians doing very, very well? Well, they were working hard to love other believers and a love that reflected their love for God. We all know the two commandments that Christ left us with, to love God with all of our heart, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself, right? We know those. If you, if you don't, those, those are from Jesus' teachings. What this community of believers did embrace was a proactive concern for one another's lives. You know, we weren't just people we sat beside during the reading of the scriptures. You know, we had relationship, we had family, we had, what we, we had, we had a community that actually was, was impactful and powerful and, and actually supported one another. You know, we didn't just love in word, we loved in deed and in action. And if there's one thing that the Western church is missing, and again, I, I, I say this not to condemn, but just to state the facts, is it's powerful transformational community. What the Western church, the, 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 the prosperous church has, is we have adopted, and again, we're all guilty of this to a certain extent, a consumer mentality towards church. At least once a year, I'll sit, see somebody that I know, you know I, and I know people from a number of different congregations, and I'll, I'll run into them. I've been living in this city 28 years. Hey, man, how you doing? How are things at church? Well, you know, I've dropped out. Oh, you're not going to church anymore? Why, why aren't you going? Well, you know, and this is always what they say. I wasn't getting anything from it. And often how I reply is, oh, I'm sorry. What were you putting into it? <laughs> Just a question. Because here is the deal. I, the, the church is meant to be this transformative community of mutual support. Where people, you know, help one another. 
And when it is, it's extremely powerful. It's extremely, I mean, the, the first century church changed the Roman Empire, not because of the message exclusively, but because the community that was created in those churches was so contrary to everything else that was going around. People looked at Christians and said, those people love each other. And it was attractive. And, and, and without that mutual love, it's kind of like being given the keys to a Ferrari and told that the speed limit everywhere you drive is only 25. You know, you have this incredible potential, but you can't actually do anything with it. And that's what happens when a congregation, a community does not have sin sincere love for each other. So that, that is what, that is what the Hebraic Christians were doing, right? And that is part of our preparation to learn to love one another because it's not always easy to love people. It's not always easy to love me. Can I get an amen in this house? <laughs> you know, sometimes we're hard on one another, man, and we just are, but we can learn. Well, the second thing we want to talk about is what were the Philippian Christians doing that was right? Why were they so special? Well, Paul says it right in his letter. He says they were, they were active partners with him in sharing the good news about Jesus. You could say it this way. A concern for the lost is one evidence for spiritual maturity. It's not enough that we just love one another. It's critically important that we love one another. But if God is going to prepare us to go out into this world and make a difference, to be impact kind of people, we really do need to love them. And far too many people are out there preaching without any love in their heart. Because it, it, nobody wants to be preached at by somebody who doesn't care for them, do you? I don't. I find that annoying. Yeah, I really do. And, and the issue then is, is why not? Why, why don't we love the lost? Why don't we love the broken? Why don't we love the hurting? Well, it's, it's hard to love broken and hurting people. It really is. I mean, you know, they're, they're painful. They're sharp. They've been cut. They've got jagged edges. And yet there's a grace that God gives us to reach out to them, to, to embrace them. And specifically, the, this Philippian congregation, what they were doing is partnering with Paul's missionary journeys. And that's one thing we can all do if we want to love the lost. We can empower our missionaries, like Bree Giles. <laughs> Where is Bree? Yeah, right. Well, there you are. You know, Beckett, why did I say Bree? Bree, I haven't sent you out. It's your sister. Give me a break. And you're not a Giles anymore anyway. You're a Wilson. So what do I know? <laughs> but it's a, it's a faux pas. It happens to old men. But the, uh, the thing about Becca and all of our other missionaries that, that we support here is that they're out there doing the work. And they deserve respect, and they deserve support, and we all should be supporting them. But, but you see, it's, it's more than that. It's how we treat the lost. You know, you can have conversations with people that are, you know, just mundane. You can talk about the weather. You can talk about work. You can talk about all kinds of things. But, but I'll, if, if you really are open to it, I really believe God will give you opportunities to inject spiritual things. Like, hey, man, is there anything I could be praying for you about? Man, seriously, or, or if they share their story, say, well, would you be okay if I you know, prayed for you? And I'll, I'll just add that to the list and really be lifting you up because I believe God can make a difference. If we're sensitive to the Spirit, we can love people in tangible ways, just like the Philippian church did. And if we love the lost, then we'll empower our missionaries and our evangelists and all the people who are out there sharing the gospel who, with love in their hearts to do great things, Okay. That's the second thing. So what was the third thing we're going to talk about? What the Hebrew Christians were doing wrong. Why were they being rebuked? Why were they being corrected? Why was the writer of this smacking them? And I, you know, I, I, again, I just can't help but smile. I'd tell you more, but y'all too dull and don't listen anyway. <laughs> I just think that's, that's a, every preacher has probably felt that way at one time. <laughs> and, so it's, it's, it's a, and, and the answer to that question is simple. They were not applying what they had been taught. As simple as that. I mean, and then come on. If you compare yourself to Jesus, do you fall short? Yes, of course you do. <laughs> you know, 
That's, we all do. Nobody's perfected. Nobody's got, you know, nail prints on their hands. You know, we, we are all imperfect reflections of Christ. But, but come on, there's a point when you got to own the reality that you've been reading the scripture over and over and over again, and you're just not doing anything with it. It's kind of like my, my, my I, well, never mind, I'm not going to go there. Uh, sometimes I do get smart and shut up. It's just rare, but I did. But, but, but the issue he's got with, with the, these Hebraic Christians is not that they don't know the truth. I mean, they know the truth. They're saved. He says that. You know, you are saved, but you just are languishing there. You're not maturing. You're not growing. And you're limited in what God can do with you. Because if he puts you in customer service, you're going to be like that Walmart clerk who checked in Dave. You know, you don't feel real good about Walmart when you've been standing there for 30 minutes. However, I felt great. I was in and out in a minute and a half. <laughs> You, know, you see the different experience and how it causes people to react to you when you're properly prepared, when, you, when you've moved forward. And, and, and again, they had salvation down. They had community love down. But somehow that next step of, of going out into the community and then applying the scriptures to themselves was falling short. And, and to a, a lesser extent or a greater extent, all of us fall into that category at some time. There, there are, I mean, does anybody know a truth in the scripture that you know you're not applying to your life? I mean, yeah, come on. If you, if you can't read the Bible and not find those, okay? There's stuff in there that we're not doing. We're all there. This is not included in the scriptures to condemn us, but to encourage us that there are things that God has for us that will only become a reality if we apply the word. And we become doers of the word and not hearers only, it says in another place. And so that, that's the third thing. And the fourth thing I want to talk about is, is as, as wonderfully talented and as, as engaged as the Philippian Christians were, as that church was, it wasn't as if they didn't have room to go further. And so this is something I want us to, to focus on as a final thing, is how could the Philippians have improved? And we go to verse 9, and it says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. And essentially what he's saying is that he's telling them, don't stop doing what you've been doing. Become lifelong learners and pursuers of new experiences with God. Keep pursuing God. I'm 61 years old. And at one of the most rich seasons of my life, I've been a Christian for 41 years, has been the last 12 months of God opening up my head and giving me revelation. And it's, you know, I, candidly, are you ever going to stop learning new things about God? You know, well, you can if you just stop caring, but, but, it, but there's always something more you can learn about God, about his grace, about his mercy, about his glory, about his majesty. We choose if we want to stop or not. Are there fresh experiences with the Holy Spirit that we can all have? Absolutely. But we have to make a choice to pursue those things. Because there are things that accompany our salvation that God wants us to have. He wants us to have a blessed life, not a cursed life. He wants us to reflect the fruits of the Spirit, to experience transformation, love, joy, peace. God bless you, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Lord, give me self-control. Give me self-control. The gifts of the Spirit, miracles. You know, as God stopped answering prayers, I, I, I was having a conversation with a secessionist, a young man who didn't believe that miracles continued. And I said, are you honestly going to tell me that your position theologically is God has stopped answering prayers? Because that's what you have to believe to be a secessionist. And, and, and I just went, yeah, I, I don't believe that. You know, does God answer every prayer, everything I ask for? Is it a yes? No. But dude... Your position is, is irrational to me. It, it, God has things for us, things that accompany salvation. 
He has an empowered community that is a transformational community if we're willing to be developed. If we go through learning to love each other, learning to love the lost, dealing with the things that we're not applying in our lives, and making a decision to be a lifelong learner. To open ourselves up and, and, and you know, again, loving, <laughs> loving those things. And, and how can we do that? Well, we just ask some questions. How can I serve the body? What can I do that will bless you? How can I help you in your troubles and your anxieties and your stresses? How can I be there for you? How can I be what, what the Hebraic Christians were? People who worked hard at loving one another. How can we serve? Because the Bible says everybody has a gift. And that gift was given with a purpose. And the purpose was to serve one another that the whole body might grow up into the image of Christ and everyone become mature. The second thing is, how can I help share the gospel? Whether it's supporting Becca or one of our other missionaries, whether it's you know, being candid about our own faith, we don't have to be rude, obnoxious, and, and ugly. That's it may help you. In fact, I think people who share the gospel rudely, obnoxiously, and ugly should shut up and go do something else because I don't think they're really helping the cause. Let's just say that. We one time, Frida, we had a, an evangelist came to Kansas City when I was living there, and we were doing this outreach in City Park, and the, the worship team went down, and they played on this, this band. We were supposed to go out in the park and invite people to come over and hear the gospel. Well, you know, we went out and asked people, and nobody came hardly. We had maybe 20 people that gathered. And when the guy got done preaching, he was such a, an ugly, mean-spirited thing, and then he, then he yelled at all of us. And then said, you don't care about the gospel, you know, and just chose and chewed us all out. And I'm like, dude, I gave up a whole Saturday to be down here, and I'm getting yelled at. And I'm like, uh, you know, but this thing was not about you. This was about Christ, but somehow you've made it about you. Just a little side note. We got to learn to love lost. I got to start asking what I haven't put into practice. What have I read? What have I heard? What have the Lord revealed to me that is something he wants me to apply to my life? Whether it's forgiving my enemies or, you know, walking in grace, whether it's keeping my mouth shut. He tells me that a lot. I don't know why that is. Anybody else get told to keep your mouth shut? Just, you know, a couple of, yeah. It's, Ken, I don't imagine, you know, if you, you know the verse where it says where words are many, sin abounds? I just, you know, I've, apparently I've lived that truth for far too long. But, but we all have things like that, don't we? Things that God tells us to do, that he wants us to do, and, and we just, for whatever reason, eh, not today. Maybe we ought to start saying, hey, maybe today, so that we can experience all the goodness the Lord has for us. And finally, what are some spiritual experiences that we'd like to try, or he'd like us to try? Perhaps coming to a worship service on a Friday night at 6.30, right here in the sanctuary. Because, you know, I, I know people, they say, well, I don't know if worship's really for me. Why don't you just show up and see what God does in the room? Even if you don't want to sing, just show up and see what happens. It might surprise you. You know, come forward sometime when we invite people to the front to be prayed for and let somebody lay hands on you. You might be shocked what occurs. You know, it might make your hair fall out. That's what happened to me. I, I, they were laying hands on me and my hair just all completely fell out. One day. No, I, it's, it's there. But as we, as, we, as we talk these things through, this is what the Lord has for us. It is a mature, healthy relationship with God that doesn't leave us stagnated at that entry point of salvation, but allows us to grow and become effective ministers for the glory of God, to be effective in our vocations, whatever our vocations are, to be effective in our relationships, to be, uh, to be lights in dark places, to be salt to a saltless earth, to be, to be a reflection of Christ. Because that's really what we want to be, right? But in order for that to happen, we've got to walk the walk and we have to lay the foundations that will really let us do what he has called us to do to love one another to love the lost and to move forward if you'd stand with me as we close the service in prayer <sighs> mm. I was just going to kind of launch into my prayer that kind of prepared but I just feel like there's some people that there's, uh, I mean, you have, you have something really specific that you need God to do for you. And I'm not asking you to share it, 
But I am asking, if you've got something, you're, you've come in this morning and you just say, man, I need God to do something for me. Would you just slip your hand up? I'm not going to ask you forward. I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand. you got something you need to get. Tony's over here. you got some others. Put your hands up. People whose hands, like Tamara, your hands are up. Would somebody around them, if you are comfortable, just go put your hand on their shoulder and start praying for them. And, and folks around here and others, you see there's a young man right here, and, and I'm looking. Okay. Don't let anybody. Okay. Just good. Good. And, and, and this is something, you know, yeah, no, I really need this. So God, you know, as we close the service, I, I, I just, I want to do this in obedience to, to what I believe is your spirit, that you want to answer these prayers. You want to bring deliverance. You want to bring healing. You want to bring provision. You want to bring understanding and revelation to these folks. You want, you knew what these requests were even before they raised their hand. You knew what they needed. And you told us to be anxious for nothing. So we shouldn't be afraid. I just, I just, God, I just ask you to remove the fear from the hearts of everyone whose hands are raised, both online and in person. And Lord, replace it with a, with a peace that goes beyond revelation or understanding, that, that, that it, it may not make sense to everybody around them, but that there would be peace in their souls. Because there's a confidence that you not only know their needs, you're moving to make a provision, you're moving to make a way. And God, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. I thank you, God, that as family, we can hold one another up. And I speak blessings over them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.